Hey everyone, it's your brother Max Popshinsky and welcome to The Loading Bookshelf. Today, we are going to have an interview with Gregory Kukol, who is the author of Tactics on How to Share Your Christian Convictions. By the end of this interview, I hope that you will get to learn about Gregory himself, secondly, the Colombo tactic, thirdly, how to find flaws and the common flaws in the current generation when we discuss our convictions, and lastly, what Gregory would tell his younger self. So, let's get into the interview. Hello, brother. Hey, Max. How you doing, buddy? Awesome. Such a big privilege. I'm so excited. Oh, well, that's great. <laughs> Wait, before we start, can you teach me, what's the right way to say your last name? Is it I was just going to ask you the same question. Oh, yeah? Well, my last name is Bob Shinsky. Bob Shinsky. Shinsky almost like two names, huh? Bob Shinsky. I know, right? I want to say it's Polish, but maybe it's Russian. Yes. I mean, you're literally right in the middle. It's it's Ukrainian. So Poland, Russia, and like Ukraine right in between. <laughs> okay, I guess we'll start with the first question. So, the first question. Can you tell me a little about yourself? Your family, ministry, your favorite hobby, and your favorite book. Oh, my goodness. All right. Uh, well, I, I was born in 1950, so okay. I'm an old guy. Uh, came through the, what I, I think were the wonderful 50s, and, and then uh, the 60s, which are tumultuous, where a lot of the, the ideas that are mainstream in our culture right now in America uh, got their got their had their beginnings, and um, they were they're just as foolish now as they were then. Radical relativism really is at the heart of it, I think. And um, do your own thing. It was kind of the battle cry of the 60s. I had been raised in the Roman Catholic Church, and mm. there was no spiritual substance uh, for me there. I, I, when I rejected that, I, I felt I had rejected Christianity as inanimate, yeah. and then I embraced the, the philosophies of the, of the age in the 60s and the early 70s. Uh, I was never really an atheist like mm. that. I believe there was some other spiritual dimension, but frankly, it was too thoroughgoing in my thinking about it. I didn't have the tools to think carefully. I didn't have the desire to think carefully. I was like many other people, in, you know, 18 to 23. I just, uh, look, when you're a young man in a culture like that, yeah. you, you, the last thing you want is religion. Oh, yeah. And ideas of purity and righteousness yeah. and stuff, <laughs> you, know, you know, spoiling the party, you know. So I just kind of went my own way until in 1973, as a result of my younger brother becoming a Christian. Mm -hmm. Um, I put my trust in Christ, and that changed everything. I moved into a Christian community soon after that in Westwood Village by UCLA. I was a student at UCLA at the time. That was my third university. I'd been in Northern Illinois. I'd been at Michigan State, and now I was at UCLA. Um, but I ended up leaving UCLA to study the Bible full time in an unofficial way, and then I ended up getting a bachelor's degree in the Bible. Mm. And, uh, and but my, that turn in my life, Max, um, was was you know complete. <laughs> it was yeah. a, a radical change. Uh, it was a radical repentance, and I don't mean repentance in the sense that I quit sinning. Yeah, because I didn't. I still haven't. Of course, for <laughs> these years. But there were larger concerns that took a while to, to be to get my head on straight about. But what happened was it was a radical change in worldview. I saw the world in an entirely different way, and that manifest itself in the way that I lived my life and how the plans I made and the values I had and all of these other things. Uh, these have ramifications, okay? Um, so uh, I ended up going, I mentioned earlier to, uh, to you uh, that to the, the communist bloc countries in yeah. 1976, working with Christians there and in Hungary and Romania and Czechos, the former Soviet Union. Uh, uh, I was in Czechoslovakia, you'll see in the East Germany and Poland a lot, and uh, also in the Ukraine, which is your homeland. Yes. And um, and that had a profound impact on me. Uh, then in my own journey, uh, I uh, went to Thailand for eight months, nine months, seven months, working with the Cambodian refugees, and that was another profound experience. And uh, just giving me depth and perspective and understanding, I became a staff pastor in, of a church in the mid '80s, and I was there until 1993 when we mm. started Stand to Reason. And uh, now it's been 28 years with Stand to Reason. The reason I started Stand to Reason, I was really by myself with one other person, um, was to make the best use of my gifts. Yeah. And I had been encouraged uh, to focus, and I think that is the biblical idea. The, the Bible doesn't teach that 
ministry gets distributed by, by calling. Because everybody's into calling. I don't know if the Lord's calling me to. Well, that's mm -hmm. The Bible doesn't teach that. Um, calling in that sense is extremely rare. Paul was called as an apostle. But yes. he was called, hey, Paul, you know, why are you persecuted? Yeah. So um, uh, he was literally called. For the rest of us, though, God distributes ministry through gifting. And so our job is to figure out what has God enabled us to do well and begin focusing on developing that. So we are to be specialists. That's the idea of 1 Corinthians 12 and say Romans 12 where it talks in detail about gifts. Um, mm. We all have a special gift. So I was focusing in on that. That's what uh, was the motivating force of birthing Stan Paris 28 years ago now almost. And, um, and in that time, God has just been amazing in what he's done. Now, uh, I just want to add this for perspective, because yes. in 28 years, it's been a bull market for Stand to Reason. I've been in radio for 30 years. I've been traveling all over the world. I've been in, you know, you know summer before last, I was on four different continents, for goodness sake. You know, I don't travel internationally wow. that much. And of course, last year, not too much travel, but I do about 150 talks a year, and we've got a team of people who add to that, and wow. um, I've got a number of books written. And so, I, But I only say this, not to try to impress people, but to see... Um, there's been a lot of productivity um, when you focus and you are a student of your craft and you are, are intentional about serving God productively. Yes. And then God responds, all right, if you're faithful in the small things, he gives you a larger thing. However, not just for me, but the rest of our standards and team, there has been a lot of challenge and attack in our private lives. Relationships have been under attack. We've actually had three deaths in Stan for Reason. Uh, in the last seven years, and wow. our, our um, wow. you know, our our number two person, who is really de facto number one, Melinda Penner. Yeah. Um, uh, she was the backbone of Standards, and she ran everything. Yeah. And uh, she did all the hard work. I got all the credit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she fell off a ladder in 2017 and cracked her skull, and has not been out of bed since then. Wow. Over three years, she was just instantaneously taken out. And she's only marginally lucid after three years. She had serious uh, traumatic brain injury. Wow. So I, I, I only throw this in for balance because I think it's easy for people to look at, a, 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 I think, a, a wildly successful enterprise called Stan yeah. Reason. Yeah. Um, which is not successful because of me. It's successful because a large team of people filled with the Holy Spirit using it gives to work. To, I just work for Stan Reason. I am not Stan Reason. Yeah. And, um, and I'm trying to work myself out of a job out here. Mm -hmm. But um, when, you, when God is doing magnificent things in, in, a, in a, a public ministry or an individual life, that does not mean there aren't hardships in that person's life that other people, or the team's life that other people have no visibility with. Uh, that comes with the territory. I'm just saying that this is part of the program. And, uh, and read First Peter, read Matthew chapter 10, you know, all kinds of warnings about these things that are going to happen. Peter says, why are you surprised at the fiery ordeal that's, that's among you, which has come upon you for the, your testing? This isn't, a minute. this isn't odd, this isn't out of the ordinary, this is normal. So I want people to see that, that there's a, it's a soldier's life yes. to be a productive Christian, all right? And we are expendable, and we are in the line of fire. I want more soldiers like you, Max, to be standing up in the line of the fire. Yes. But my counsel to people like you and others listening is that's a soldier's life. Yeah. All right. And uh, and there are casualties. Yes. So be sober-minded about it. And so anyway, this, so this has been, I mean, largely that. I got married when I, in uh, 1998. I was, uh, actually, I had my 48th birthday on my honeymoon. Mm. Uh, we had our first daughter in 2004. I was 54, and then when I was 57, we had another. Uh, now, those daughters were adopted because both my wife and I were a little older, and mm -hmm. we lost a baby. And um, so, so now I have two daughters and a wife and, and three cats, and two of those are female. So I, there's a lot of estrogen. Around. <laughs> I'm kind of lonely, uh, but um, that is, uh, you know, and we're doing uh, our best we can to raise them um, in the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, that both of our daughters are not Christian, just saying for the record, um, as it turns out. And um, that's something we're working with and praying more than anything else, praying about, because yeah. you get to a point, especially when somebody's a teenager, where you, you just can't keep hammering. I mean, yeah. you, you got to let them go 
and love yeah. them up and uh, and be the kind of model, hopefully, just hard as a parent, be the kind of model that the gentleman was who influenced you so yeah. much, as you described earlier, um, to become a Christian. So uh, so here I am now at uh, Push in 71, and... Um, 28 years with Stand to Reason, very satisfied with what God has done, uh, very intent in my own life to finish well, to run the course, yes. another 15 more years or so, and I'll be done. Uh, awesome. <laughs> hey, I just want to stay faithful. I don't yes. know how long I'm going to be in the saddle, but certainly I want to stay faithful the whole time and, and reproduce my life and the lives of other people uh, like yourself. Even though this is the first time we've met, yeah, I know from what you said, there's been some influence by the book tactics, etc. Yeah, yeah, and this is the heartbeat of my life. It's the heartbeat for me is not evangelism; it's discipleship. Awesome. And, uh, and I want to reproduce and mentor, even at a distance, um, a whole army of Christians that will carry on after me as I fight. If I pass the baton well to them, yeah, and that's a big part of what Stand to Reason does. So, you, you know about the reality conferences that we do? Yeah, I heard about it, but I never like. I just got to know you through the book, you know, like which I read like a month ago. So, yeah, yeah still well, in October, uh, in October, we're going to have a reality conference there in Seattle. It's uh, the probably the last full weekend of October. So oh, okay. Like you can go at str.org on our website to find out. But um, this started in Orange County a number of years ago, maybe uh, ten or twelve years ago. We had the flagship operation. Now we we developed this by going to different regions. So the next region was uh, Central South in the Texas area. The next Dallas, principally. The next one was the the, the Southeast, and that was uh, Birmingham. And now we're going to be uh, this twenty twenty two. We're going to be in Augusta, Georgia, but that mm -hmm. represents yeah. that region. Uh, we opened up um, Seattle last year in November, um, and uh, we opened up Minneapolis two years ago for yeah. Central and Mid Midwest. And I like to joke if we can uh, find any Christians in New England, uh, we'll maybe do do one there. But that will kind of box the compass for us in the states. So we've just won six, but it's focused on young people mm -hmm. and uh, m middle schoolers and high schoolers principally. Though we don't check IDs at the door, and lots of people come. But to give you an idea of the appeal. Uh, the last time we had one, it was 2019, 2020 was locked out because of the politics of COVID, let me put yeah. it that way, in Southern Cal. Um, we, in 2019, we had 2,700 students, 2,700 young people show up at our conference, and the wow. number didn't building every single year. That was a Costa Mesa in Calvary Chapel, and we filled the main auditorium of 2,000, we filled their gym too. And because we teach apologetics, like yeah. we teach it to adults, but we we make it more fun for the young people. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not in charge of the fun. I'm not. <laughs> but uh, but it is fun, and it's a huge success. And uh, when we opened up Minneapolis two years ago, we had uh, the very first one. We had 2,400 students, and. Um, now, we, we cut back last year, 2020, because we had restricted yeah. attendance, so we were yeah. like a little over 1,500, but I mean, we could have pushed 3,000 if we had no restrictions from COVID. Wow. Um, and, but even with COVID, we were able to open up in Seattle with about 350 students, you know, very restricted because of that. And, um, and we're moving forward because this reflects Stand to Reason's commitment to what we consider the most important generation, and the most important generation is always the next generation. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And we want to pass the baton. So anyway, there's a, my my thumbnail sketch. Maybe it wasn't quite just a thumbnail. No, totally fine. Oh, yeah, I'm just super curious. What's your favorite hobby? Like, what do you love to do? You would say. Okay. Well, I, I actually have two hobbies. Ooh, okay. I'll hear this. Um, and, and neither I get to do as much as I like. Uh, yeah. I, I love fishing. Okay? Fishing. Okay. And, uh, growing, up the, growing up in the Midwest and having some property in northern Wisconsin that my grandfather bought many years ago that has now fallen to me. We have a, a, a place there on a lake and uh, I have a boat up there. We got some tow vehicles. And so um, I love going up to northern Wisconsin fishing for bass, mm. particularly smallmouth bass up there. And uh, and I spend a couple weeks in May and then a few weeks in, in, in June with my family. Um, and uh, we've fixed it up. So I, 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 I really like that. I'm actually building a fishing rod right now. To Nice. I have a whole bunch of fishing rods. i got way too many, but anyway. <laughs> uh, but I'm serious about, about that, I, and I, awesome. I, um, it's a lot of fun when I'm there. 
Okay, uh, but in the meantime, I have a, a, a workshop and a standalone building on my property, mm -hmm. so I have a, a 400 square foot woodworking shop. Yeah. And I've got all the tools and everything, and I and I don't get out there that often, but at least that's here at home. And if I yes. you know, just the edge, I can just go out my back door and into the shop, and I can work on some things. Maybe fix something for my wife. But yeah. To me, working with my hands in that way is really good. And uh, some of your listeners maybe maybe have watched videos that I've done in the past that so actually filmed in my shop. Mm. So uh, I'm gonna have that's, to watch those. That's kind of fun. Um, the, I mentioned to you earlier that we have Stan the Reason University now yeah. on our website. So that's STRU, but it's mm -hmm. at, at str.org. That's our website. And uh, the, the, one of the first courses I did, and they're, they're short, you know, courses. They have like six individual sessions, and each of the sessions are maybe five to ten minutes long. They're easy. Yeah. But when I do the one on the being a good ambassador, a lot of that was filmed in my workshop, so people will be able to see. Nice. So nice. anyway, uh, yeah, I love woodworking, and um, I read about it more than I do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I fishing, which I also read about more than I do. But yeah. um, that's part of my. Those are avocations of mine. I really, really enjoy it a lot. Mm, I saw. And then so basically, the last one is like, what would you say your favorite book or a book that had a tremendous influence on you? Uh, that's a, a little bit more difficult to mm -hmm. pinpoint. Um, the, I, there are two that come to mind, mm -hmm. and one of them is Mere Christianity. Oh, okay. And that's a classic, obviously, mm -hmm. came out 75 years ago. Yes. Almost. Uh, actually, came out right after I was born, so it isn't quite that old. Mm -hmm. But it reflects material that C.F. Lewis did in the yes. 40s on a radio broadcast, and uh, that has certainly withstood the test of time. And uh, it's, it's a... It's a uh, it's a it's a broad view of Christianity and uh, done in a C.S. Lewis style. In fact, I love it so much that I have written a book that is meant to be like it in a certain mm. sense. A lot of people don't read Lewis anymore, young people, because they think he's too hard, which blows my mind because I think he's a, the most accessible re writers. Uh, and so, what I uh, four years ago uh, I wrote a book called The Story of Reality: How Story the World of... Began, How It Ends and everything important that happens in between. And uh, that actually received a number of awards, but it was one of those books that I felt like I, I didn't know if I could really write it. You know, uh, and I'm starting it. I said, I don't know if I can do this. But I had been thinking about it for years and years and collecting information, and, and it finally went to print and it has been really well received, the story of reality. And, um, and it's meant to be, my, in a certain sense, a, a nod to Lewis, because I think the, what he did was so important, I was trying to fill that niche for a new generation. Yeah. And also, in the kind of gentle but uh, incisive voice that Lewis provided in his work. Uh, I've had a lot of people, you, you can look at Amazon, where people yeah. are responding and said, that sounds like Lewis to me, which this is like maximum, uh, <laughs> the maximum uh, kind of a, a compliment. That yeah, I yeah. Oh, I uh, the, other, the other book uh, is, is now, there were actually three books, but you can get them in one volume now, mm -hmm. and the author is Francis Schaeffer, who died oh. in the 80s. Yeah. And uh, so I, I'm glad at the nod there that you're familiar yes. with the name at least, because he was a remarkable individual, and probably more than anyone else, formed my whole approach to um, to understanding and Christianity, seeing Christianity as a thoughtful Christian and the way to make my case as a Christian. Now, he was write, written, writing to a modern gentle yeah. generation, a, a modernist idea, a enlightenment frame of mind. <clears throat> Since then, you've had postmodernism and yeah. a whole bunch of all the, the XYZ generation yeah, stuff. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad they're at Generation Z because they just ran out of letters, so maybe they'll quit doing that. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, but he uh, had the, such profound insight and prescience that uh, what he said was he equipped me well to be able to deal with any generation. Uh, the book is called, uh, well, it's called now the Francis Schaeffer Trilogy, but the three titles are The God Who Is There, mm -hmm. He Is There and He Is Not Silent, mm -hmm. and Escape from Reason. And it's a little bit philosophically oriented. He's looking at the history of philosophy, history of thought, at least modern thought. And but he, his his characterizations, the way he understands how the modern mindset is working, and it's really the human mindset, um, is phenomenal. He's got a distinction called the upper story and the lower story that has been really helpful for me to understand.
human beings. So those are the, the two people that had the greatest influence in that way. In, in a personal basis, I have two people. One was Craig Englert, who was my original disciple, or when I was a, a new Christian, put me on a, a really good trajectory. And that went for two years, over two years, mm -hmm. that discipleship relationship. Actually, it lasted for probably closer to four. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I mean, I wouldn't be who I am, where I am now without Craig. Mm -hmm. And then later on, when I picked up, uh, I took, I worked on my second master's degree in philosophy with yeah. J.P. Moreland. I have to tell it that J.P. has had a powerful influence in my life. We've been friends for probably 30 years now. And uh, he is, he's a go-to guy for me when I get in a tough situation uh, of different sorts. And um, we don't agree on everything, as it turns yeah. out, in big areas of disagreement. Uh -huh. But he's such a dear, precious friend to me, and, awesome. and we have a sweet relationship. And I, I, I have, I have been influenced so much by him as a thoughtful Christian. So I just have to mention him as well. No, that's awesome. I read Shakespeare's uh, "How Should We Then Live." Oh, His yeah, book, that's right. that, awesome that book, a, a derivative book after the the foundational stuff, but yeah. he repeats so much of his basic concepts in yeah. all his book that you get a sense of how he, uh, he um, I actually met Schaefer a couple of times. Oh, well, but, nice. Uh, and I spent some time at Labrie in 1976 yeah. as a visitor, uh, and he was there, so uh, that was a great experience. That's awesome, wow. Yeah, you might know Nancy Piercy. Nancy Piercy was also a, a disciple of Francis Schaefer and mm -hmm. went to Labrie. Um, Oz Guinness, who many know, also a Schaefer, he was discipled by, he ran a Libri in England, so he yeah. was very connected with that organization. So, um, it, it, he said, uh, Schaefer has had a pr profound influence on so many, else, so many people's lives. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so we're moving to the second question, sure. and the Colombo tactic. For example, how would you explain the Colombo tactic to someone who has never heard it or never read your book? Let's say in like three to five minutes, how would you explain it? Yeah. Well, the best way, it's very simple actually, Max, Yeah. Uh, the, the, the easiest, safest, most effective way to navigate in any conversation that is controversial is by using questions. Yes. All right? I mean, it's just very simple. Now, why do I call it Colombo? Because some people may remember Lieutenant Colombo from yeah. about yep. 40 years ago. Uh, who was a detective and who who had come to the scene disheveled um, with a stump of a cigar, you know, uh, stuck wrenched between his fingers and um, wearing a trench coat and scratching his head and uh, I mean he looks like he, he is, he's stupid, right? Yeah. But he's yeah. like a fox because he he has a he has a way about him. He has a method, and that's the way he uses questions. So. He comes in under the radar. He's not threatening. He's not in your face. Yeah. He doesn't have people's guard up. They think he's not this guy. I don't. The the, the killer, because it's a murder mystery, is all we know who he is all the time. Yeah. And or she, and um, it's part of the first scene, the setup for the rest. And the question is whether in this complex set of circumstances, Columbus going to get the bad guy right. And uh, the bad guys always kind of some way or again, oh no, they're not going to get me, especially this idiot. Yeah. So he comes in under the radar, but then by asking questions, he's gathering information and positioning himself in a way that he can lower the boom. So this is the, he's the, the iconic model for me of the technique. So by asking questions, we are, well, we're genuinely interested in the person's view and the, what it is and, and trying to understand it accurately. And by the way, when we understand it accurately, we are not inclined to misrepresent it. Uh, misrepresenting a view is a common yeah. mistake people made. It's bad thinking and it's bad manners. It's called a straw man fallacy yeah. for those who are interested in the names. Um, it, you erect a, a false characterization, which is like a scarecrow, which is easy to knock over. And instead of dealing with the real idea, which is going to be much more difficult. So anyway, um, uh, if, you, if you get a clearer fix on the person's view, you're not likely to fall into that mistake. Yes. And, and so uh, that's one thing that ke the questions do. Uh, they give you different types of information. Yes. They'll give you information about the person's view. And then you, you, the information about why the person holds the view they hold. 
So this is the second step. Now, I just want to make an observation stepping back here. I've just offered the first two steps of the game plan uh, because there's a three steps in yeah. this tactical game plan. That's the way the, the book is titled, a game plan for discussing your Christian convictions. Um, these two steps are the easiest steps imaginable to allow you to have engagement with people who disagree with you without getting into a fight yes. and without creating any risk for yourself. Because if I were to ask you, Max, let's just say I was a non-Christian, I would say, hey, man, man Max, yeah, you became a Christian. You were just some wild guy, you know. What, 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 what the heck is that all about? What does that mean? Yeah, Christian. I mean, I just think you go to church, right? I guess, but I mean, it's got to be more than that because you used to go to church. Yeah. What? And so now, what I have done is I've just simply drawn you out. Am I vulnerable right now? No, well, I've just asked for information. Yes. So you're going to tell me all about it. You're going to say like, "Well, Jesus died for your sins," and I'm going to say, "I have no idea what that means." Okay. By the way, this is a problem for Christians because they do use that language, which is entirely accurate. But it is largely religious noise mm -hmm. to non-Christians, especially today. What do you mean, he died for my yeah, sins? Yeah. What sins? I'm a good yeah. person. Are you yeah. kidding? Yep. Why would you say that? And what, what does his death have to do with me? Yeah. Okay, now notice that I'm just using this as an example here, um, as a kind of a role play. If I were asking those kinds of questions, I'm drawing you out. I'm trying to get clarity yes. on your view, but because I'm asking the questions the way I'm asking them, it forces you to be much more precise about what your view entails. Now, if I were to ask you as the Christian man, actually knowing you, uh, if I got more precise about these things, I know I'm going to get more precise answers. A lot of Christians can't give more precise yeah. answers, all right? Um, but if they... But you can, because just of your background or your training and your scholarship, you know, your studiousness. Um, but then that more information, well, now it becomes, it starts to become more clear to me as a non-Christian, what you mean. But um, if you don't know how to clarify, yeah. which many Christians don't, you're going to be kind of stuck. You're stuck with your slogan, and you don't know what to yeah. say about it. And then if I were to say, okay, I think I understand, I, I, I got a little bit back, but why would you believe all of that stuff? Please, this is the 20th century, 21st century, for goodness sake. Why would you believe 2,000 years ago a guy did something that accomplishes what you said? And how are you getting it from? You're getting it from, what, that old book? Really? Yeah. Do you know how many times it's been retranslated? So now I'm asking mm -hmm. you for a justification yeah. for the view that you said to me. Now, again... In this conversation, do I have any vulnerability? I, as the questioner, have no vulnerability. Yeah. Why not? Because I'm not expressing my view. I'm asking you about. Excuse me. I'm asking you. I'm getting all wired, fired up here. Yeah. <laughs> like it. I'm asking you about your view. Yeah. So I'm, and I don't even have to know what your view is. Yeah. That's why I'm asking the question. So notice how, <clears throat> as a challenger now, using questions. Yep. Yeah. I'm coming into the shallow end of the pool. This is very simple. I don't need to know philosophy, theology. Yeah. I don't need to know any, anything. I don't even know how to defend my own view because my own view is not in, que not in question here. It's your view that's in question, man. It's in this case, the Christian view. Yeah. And, and um, so <laughs> I'm just listening, and I'm getting an education. But I'll tell you what's going on, especially if you're a Christian who doesn't know your stuff very well. You're going to start getting uneasy. Yeah. And you're getting uneasy because you think, he's asking me questions I don't know how to answer. And these are questions that only have to do, at this point, with a clarification of what I actually believe. And I can't even make it clear. Yeah. I can't put it in words that he understands. And I'll tell you why. Because I think many Christians don't understand it either. Which is why I wrote the book, The Story of Reality. To give a more robust understanding of what the big picture of Christianity represents. Yeah. And so, and so, um, uh, and the next step, of course, when the Christian is asked the reasons for their view, yeah. oh my goodness, 
uh, I mean, so many Christians are completely flat-footed yeah. because the reasons that they're Christians is because they were raised a Christian. They were told Christianity is right. That's all they've been exposed to, blah, 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 blah. And this makes them vulnerable to challenges as to the rationale of why any outsider should believe Christianity is true. Now, I am simply using the dynamic of the first two steps of the game plan to show how it would work with a Christian, yes. if I were the non-Christian, okay? It works, ex and actually there's an atheist, you got his book here over here in my bookcase, uh, Peter Bogosian, mm -hmm. who's written a manual for creating atheists, who uses exactly the same technique. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you read my book or, or not, but, uh, <laughs> probably not, because in a certain sense this te approach isn't that profound. Yeah. Um, it goes back to Socrates four mm -hmm. centuries yeah. before Christ, you know, the Socratic method, but yeah. I've just found a way to, to package it to make it easier for Christians yes. to use. But notice if it was an atheist asking a Christian that the atheist is com has no vulnerability because the atheist views are not on the line. He, he's not advancing atheism. Yeah. And in fact, Peter Bogosian says, don't try to convince people to be atheists. And Bogosian says, don't even, don't even try to attack their religion. Just ask them questions about their views especially about their faith, what faith amounts to. Mm. And he's very successful in getting atheists to get Christians to change their mind and become atheists, even though they're not even making the case for atheism. Okay? Wow. So I, I'm, I'm pointing out the dynamic of the technique. The technique can be used on either side. Okay? Yeah. So um, when Christians get stuck, it's because they don't really understand their view very well. They've used the slogans, and they don't know the reasons why their view is right. All right, which is why we got you guys like you, Max, you know, training young people in apologetics. Yeah. So, so the the, the exact, exact same dynamic works in reverse. All right. So now let's change it. You're the atheist, and yeah. I'm the Christian. Okay, and you start telling me. Well, I'm an atheist, okay? I said, what kind of atheist are you? There's lots of different kinds of atheists. They, yeah. all, they, they all reject God. Yeah. But they do you just merely lack a belief in God, as some will claim? Or do you actually believe there is no God? Are you completely, like, no views at all about this? Like, I, I don't even think about I just have no conviction about this or that or God. I'm just like a blank slate. Okay, that's one type of atheist. Uh, there are not many of those, by the way. A lot yeah. of people claim to be that. But the other kind is like, no, they think there is no God. That's why they write books about this. There is yeah. no God. Okay, so that's a belief. Or, oh, that, okay. So are you a materialist or a non-materialist? I mean, do you believe that... There is no God because there is nothing outside of the material world. Uh, okay, then there's no God, there's no angels, there's no demons, there's no souls. Yeah. There's no objective morality. That's not the moral rules of the universe that Christians talk about. Those those aren't physical, you know. So, okay, so good. Oh, oh great. So, are you a determinist then if you just think the material world exists? Really? You're not a determinist? You think you have free will? How does that work in a world where there's no souls? There's just molecules flashing. So now that's a little liability I know about the view, but I'm just asking. But notice, what am I doing? I'm just curious about your view. Yeah. Mr. Massey Atheist, I'm just, I'm just asking questions. All yeah. I'm doing right now is asking questions about what the view is. Yes. And it's not unusual, after a couple of these questions, where people say, atheists. They don't know what to say because they've never thought about yes. this. So do you believe in objective morality? You're like, are there, are you, Have you ever complained about the problem of evil, Mr. Atheist? Yeah, of course. Evil is in the world. Yeah, now, yeah. Oh, well, I, I, now I'm really confused. How yeah. can you have evil in yes. the world if it's a materialistic world? I mean, on your view. Well, it's obvious. No, I understand it is obvious there's evil in the world, but how on your view, I don't see how that could be the case. Can you help clear this up for me? Okay, what am I doing? Just asking questions about his view. All right. I haven't even asked him yet the second question. Why do you think atheism yeah. is true? And why do you think God doesn't exist? That's another step. Yep. Okay. Now, keep in mind, now for me as a Christian at this point, I'm still in the shallow end <clears throat> of the pool. 
I haven't advanced Christianity. I haven't given arguments for God. I haven't taken that responsibility on myself. I'm just being a student of the other person's views. I'm asking questions and very attentive to what they're saying. This is good manners. Yeah. And it's requiring of that atheist to think more carefully about it, what he actually claims. Now, I think there are all kinds of problems with atheism as a worldview. And for one, they can't make sense of the most obvious feature of the world. Uh, well, there's a, multi, a couple of one of the most <laughs> obvious, and that is that there's something's wrong yeah. with the world. Okay, it's the problem of evil. Or that the world is here. Where did this thing come from? Oh, Big Bang. Well, I, I get that. My question is, who banged or what banged the Big Bang? Things don't just bang themselves, yeah. right? They don't just pop into existence. I mean, I, uh, you know, when the wife walks into the house and looks in the garage, said, honey, where'd that Mercedes SL come from? <laughs> well, that just popped into existence out of nothing, honey. That's the way the universe started, so I don't know why I can't get a car out of it. Nobody's going to believe that. Yeah. Why do we believe that about the universe? That doesn't make any sense. Okay, so so notice how now I'm 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 asking questions of a different nature, okay, that go to certain the coherence of certain of those views, all right? And uh, so so and, and why would they believe that? What are the reasons? And there are trouble. What about the, if you believe in the problem of evil, I don't know how that makes any sense with atheism the way you've described it. Yeah. Notice here I have not said a single word about my own convictions or or about Christianity. I have not yeah. said a single word against atheism. I am just asking questions to get clarification and then when I'm aware of that and I'm aware that there are problems because of my own training, this is where people can learn their problems of atheism. But when you learn them, you don't poke people in the eye with it. You use a question. You say, well, I'm not confused. How does this work? How does this work? Okay. I'm just sitting here. I've got nothing to defend. There's nothing I can be attacked on. My, my attitude is gracious and warm. It's interactive. It's curious. It's taking the other person's views seriously. You know, what's not to love? You know, yeah. it's fabulous. Now, there are yes. more aggressive ways to use this, but uh, pretty much I've just described broadly the characteristics of the game plan. And um, there's a lot more in the book on tactics, yeah. but the the first third of it is the game plan proper, which I'm yes. describing, and I call it the Columbo tactic. Yeah. And that is what gives you your entree into casual, pleasant conversations with other people. In fact, in the book, I make this promise. I say, I'm going to give you a game plan. And by the way, make the same promise when I speak publicly, even if I only got 45 minutes. I say, I'm going to give you a game plan that's going to allow you to converse with confidence in any situation. Yes, yes. No matter how little you know, yes. or how knowledgeable, or aggressive, or even obnoxious the other person happens to be. Now, that's a, that's a heavy claim, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I said, no worries. I'm going to fulfill this. You watch me. And then I give them just the first two steps. What do you mean by that? So that's your first yeah. step. You're gathering information about their view. How did you come to that conclusion? This is the other model yeah. question. You're asking for their justification. You're reversing the burden of proof. Two steps. Easy. Anybody can do this. Uh, my daughter can do it. Yep. My daughter's 13. My 16-year-old could, too. But I'm just taking my youngest one. And she's not so much into the tactical thing at 13. Yeah. She's into poking people in the eye with it. <laughs> Hopefully over time we'll teach her yeah. how to use questions, but uh, in any event, um, uh, I, what I want your listeners and viewers to, to, to catch is how easy this is and how effective it is. It's unbelievable. Yes. I unbelievable. totally agree, brother. Jesus used the technique, by the way. He asked more than 300 questions yes. in the Gospels. So I don't think he read the book, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and if I could say, you know, I'm, I'm very, very happy with the reception it's it's gotten because um, I, I think I went yesterday. I think I, in the 10th anniversary edition, yeah. which is the, the new one, and yes. some of your listeners may have the old edition. Mm -hmm. same, basically the same cover, but this is the 10th anniversary edition emblem here. Yeah. And it's it's got like 35% more material, double the number of tactics. 
So there's a lot of updated information that I think would be helpful. I think they got the first book, okay, give that away and get the second book. <laughs> for yourself kind of thing. But when uh, you go to Amazon, I think I've got, um, I certainly have over 1,700 reviews just on the 10th anniversary edition. So this has been on for about 14 months. That's all. Mm. 15 months maybe now. Hmm. But the, the average is 4.9 out of 5, nice. which, you know, I'm really happy That's with That's pretty that. good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think my first 50 reviews were all five stars. Again, uh -huh. and I, you know, it sounds like I'm waving my flag. What I want people to be convinced of that is that other normal folk have picked up the book and found it to be yes. tremendous oh, yes. in a very, very challenging environment. And the more challenging the environment, the more that the tactical approach shines because of a layback approach drawing people out and listening to them, not preaching at them, yes. listening to them. Now, there's a place to make our point. Yes. But um, I'm convinced that that uh, we need to do more gardening than attempting harvesting when the fruit's not ripe. And I do talk about that concept yeah. in the book, too. Yeah. But thank you so much, Greg. So, move on to our next question. When you have like basic discussions, or let's just say like a debate going on, what kind of flaws do you catch mostly in these kind of conversations, and how do you respond? Like basically in this current generation, you would say. Yeah. Okay. There's two that stand out. Okay. And um, there are actually three, mm -hmm. and each of these uh, represent in what are called informal fallacies. That is, that they're mistakes in thinking. They're mistakes in the way that people are processing the information, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, the first one, uh, I'll give you like the, um, the official name is called Ad Hominem. You know, mm -hmm. if you look up in, in informal fallacy books, logic, Ad yeah. Hominem. That means literally to the man, yeah. the person. Yes. Um, and what it, all an Ad Hominem is, is name calling. Okay, so I say to you, Max, oh, you're a Christian. You're just a... Oh, do you think Jesus uh, is the only way of salvation? That's intolerant. You're such an intolerant person. Yeah. Okay, now I want people to see something really quickly. They recognize what I just did because it's done all the time. Or you're a bigot. Yeah. You don't believe in same-sex marriage? You're a bigot. Okay. Now notice, most people may not have noticed what just took place. But, but I, in modeling this response, changed the subject. All right? Yeah. So you're talking about Jesus and how he's, uh, he's a unique solution to a unique problem. The problem is the problem of evil yes. in the world and in people's individual lives and the guilt that they hold for it. And the solution is, is, is a rescuer who did something very particular. Uh, oh. That's bigoted. You're a bigot. Wait, 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 wait. We were talking about a constant of yes. an idea, a problem that human beings have, and a solution. And now we are talking about my personality. Why did you change the subject? Now, they don't even realize they changed the subject. Yeah. Because they're so used to doing this. They don't realize that they just made a mistake. No one taught them this. In fact, the people that should be taunting, to, uh, teaching this to them actually model this nonsense. They do the same thing themselves. Okay? And um, to make the point a little more clear, let's just say you went to a doctor, and the doctor said, you know, I checked out your blood work, and we did uh, you know, a CT scan and all that. You have a tumor that is growing fast, and it's and it's going to kill you if you don't get if you don't get uh, surgery right away. And you, as the patient, said, "You're mean. You're mean. You're a mean, nasty person." Now, there's an example of the same thing. You don't like the diagnosis, so you attack the person's character. But wait a minute. That has nothing to do yeah. with whether the yeah. diagnosis is accurate. By the way, could the mean doctor? Could the doctor who's actually mean? have a correct diagnosis, being mean has nothing to do with it. Yes. But this is the way it's approached. So that's called a, a ad hominem, or just if you want to just shorthand it and call it name calling. Name calling is to attack the person rather than the idea. Okay? It's to attack the person rather than the idea. 
And the way to demonstrate the mistake is to ask the person why they changed the subject. What do you mean? Well, we were talking about whether same-sex marriage is right or wrong, or that abortion is right, or that Jesus is the only way, and now you're attacking my personality, my character. Uh, by the way, you can be right about my character. How about if I just agree with you? Now that we agree that I'm, I'm a jerko, <laughs> uh, now can we talk about this other thing? Now, the, uh, the, uh, you're, the person you're talking with will have almost no understanding of what's yeah. going on. That's why you may have to move slowly because yeah. they think this is the right way. Yeah. And, uh, and the, the most, um, you, you, I could ask you just for fun what the most prevalent name-calling approach is at the present moment. What is the most prevalent charge against people? Christians or otherwise, right now. Like at this current generation, like right now at this moment. At this second. Mm, at this second. Honestly, like, like just around me, like in social media, that like, I put it, put it like something with ra racist racism in racist, in that absolutely. in that sense. Yes, I thought you weren't gonna get it. You were taking so long, but I'm gonna <laughs> say, you know what? I was. I have to make sure. It. I'm like, I have to get no, this you're right. <laughs> you see it everywhere everywhere and calling a person a racist is enough to stop the discussion to shame the other yes. person no matter what they're saying to silence them and to and to uh delegitimize anything they say yes and it has it and it has no bearing of any kind in almost every single case on their character and racist is a challenge on the character it is an attempt to identify a person based on an external, their sin color. Yeah. You're white, you're a racist, period. Yeah. Okay. I grew up in the in the 50s and the 60s, and the attitude was, you're black, therefore you're lazy, or you're a crook. Mm. Now, is that reasonable? Is that fair? No, that is prejudice. Yes. That is prejudging a person according to something inconsequential to the judgment. Right? Oh, I'm going to write that down. Because <laughs> I'm writing, I'm writing yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. about this myself. Nice. Pre awesome. Pre pre I'm writing also, so don't worry. <laughs> uh, a person, then, on something inconsequential to the judgment. All right. So, you know, just because your skin is white doesn't mean you're a racist. That's the classical use of the word. But of course, these definitions have been manipulated a lot lately. Yeah. But so, so um, that's the first thing. It's called. It's just call it name calling, and it's all over. It's everywhere, everywhere. Whether the name calling is racist or bigot or intolerant or arrogant or you know, there's all kinds of things that have come down the pike in recent years. They are all changing the subject. As I think it's fair to say, um, uh, you know, why did you change the subject? What do you mean? Well, we were talking about same-sex marriage, and now we're talking about whether I'm a nice person or not. Yeah, well, you're a bigot. Okay, well, uh, do you think it's possible I could be a bigot, but my ideas could be right? No. Really? You mean a bigot can't have a right opinion about anything? You know, I mean, that's a ridiculous thing for yeah. somebody to say, but yeah. they're just covering their turf, yes. basically, you know, when they do that. So what I'm trying to get them to see is that this is irrelevant. Okay. How about if I disagree, I am a bigot? Can we just talk about the merits of same-sex marriage and whether it's yeah. good or not for society, whatever? And now, that, that would be my maneuver. Now, there's no guarantee that people are, the light's going to go on, they say, oh man, you got a great point. I was attacking you, that is a hide hominem. That's not a very nice way to deal with things. Let's get down to the issues themselves. No, no, no. Um, it may happen. The chastisement, the gentle chastisement may put them on the right track. That's what we're hoping for. But uh, people hold ideas nowadays not for rational reasons, not because they think that same-sex marriage is a genuinely just and good enterprise for our culture. They are they, they are buying into a political agenda yeah. that they have been socialized to believe, and then they scream at people who don't accept it. All right. So that's the first mistake. The second mistake is called the genetic fallacy. 
the genetic fallacy. And that's a fallacy where you accuse somebody of being wrong because of the source of the belief. That's the genesis of the belief. Okay, the classic example is um, where um, a woman says, you're a man, you have nothing to say about abortion. Okay, so let me just put this in another in other terms to show how bad it is. So let's just say a, a man is beating his wife. And, um, and a woman says, you shouldn't be doing that. He says, you're not a husband. You have nothing to say about mm. it. You don't know what it's like for me to live with this woman. Since you're not a husband, you have nothing to say about it. I am being afflicted as a husband, therefore, blah, blah, blah. Okay, now that's the genetic fallacy because you're faulting the legitimacy of the complaint because it's coming from a particular source and the complaint itself doesn't stand alone. Now the woman in that circumstance could say, it doesn't matter whether I'm a man or a woman, what you're doing to that, that human yeah. being is wrong. Yeah. Okay? That it's coming out of the mouth of a female doesn't make my concern about what you're doing any more, uh, any any less legitimate. Yeah. You know, and I, when you explain these things, people can say, "Oh, of course." And, and, the, and with regards to abortion, the the, uh, uh, the the our pro life view is that it's wrong to do this, kill an innocent human being. Uh, for the reasons that people have abortions. Oh, well, you're a woman. You're not a woman. You're a man. Yeah. Oh, how about this? Oh, this would be a great one now. In the gender fluidity thing. Okay, for today I'm a woman. I'm just saying it. I mean, that's the politically correct route, right? Yeah. I'm going to be a woman today. I'm identifying as a woman, so now I've just took, taken your, your, your pushback away from you, you know? I mean, yeah. that would be ridiculous. Obviously, because because men don't have babies, yeah. even if they think they're women, they don't have yeah. babies, right? Men don't menstruate, yeah. right? Okay, so I mean that just goes to the lunacy of this whole approach that people are taking nowadays. But that's just an example of using their own view against them a little bit. But uh, our view is that it's wrong to do that. It, it, it doesn't matter whether I'm a man or a woman. I'm a human being, and that treatment of another human being is wrong. Well, there might be some debate about whether it's a human or not. You know, that's a separate issue. But you can't simply disqualify. Or, or what about ch child beating? Yeah. Okay. Well, you shouldn't be beating your children like that. Are you a parent? <laughs> you're not a parent. You have nothing to say to me. When you have a parent, when you're a parent, then that might be different. Might maybe a different matter. But it, it's obvious, I think, to your listeners that these are. Yeah. inappropriate ways of dismissing the complaint. But they're all examples of genetic fallacy. You're a Christian. Oh, well, you grew up in America. The atheist says, says this all the time. If you grew up in Saudi Arabia, yeah. you wouldn't be yeah. a Christian. You'd be a Muslim. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's issues of the sovereignty of God aside, that's probably true. Okay? So what? Uh, th that's meant to discredit Christianity. How does that discredit Christianity? My response to that is, well, that might be true, but if you, if you, Mr. Atheist, were born in Saudi Arabia, you wouldn't be an atheist. <laughs> yeah. So does that mean your atheism is false? No, it's not. You are Good faulting point. the idea because of the source. That's the genetic. The source is a person who grew up in America. You know, that's, those, are, those are common examples of genetic fallacy. Uh, let's see, the um, the last one that you hear is straw man. Straw man. Straw man. A straw man is where you misrepresent somebody else's viewpoint. Okay. And people will say, why, for example, I just saw it yesterday, why would God, uh, why would God punish me for creating me evil? He makes me evil, and now you say he's going to punish me for mm -hmm. that. That's not my fault, it's his fault. Is it our view that God creates people evil? No, no. that's not our view. If it were our view, that would be pretty bad. Yeah. But that's not our view. Our view is that God created human beings morally innocent. In other words, they had no inclination yes. to sin, and they had no sin nature, they had no sin at all. 
and human beings use their freedom to rebel against God, and that created a problem for the whole human race. That's our view. Yeah. And but but not that God created. And this is another. A, a, you hear the same thing. Um, why would God make me a homosexual and then tell me what it's wrong to do? What makes you think that God made you a homosexual? If yeah. you're talking about God, that's my that's on my side of the ledger, and it isn't my view that God made people into homosexuals and then punishes them for that. So notice there, and there's a lot more that can be said about yeah. both of those issues, but notice that the nature of the complaint is a re- misrepresentation of our view that makes our view look silly and easy to defeat, strong yeah. and knock it down. Okay? Those are the three main um, errors in thinking or ways of errors of uh, erroneous ways of approaching attacks on Christianity. And I, I know for some people this sounds, oh, that's kind of like complex, that's philosophy. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you, if you understand those three things, you are going to, you are going to see them everywhere. Because the vast majority, yeah. majority of challenges to uh, uh, the Christian theology and Christian values that flow from that theology um, is to do one of those three things. Either attack the person in name call, either mischaracterize and misrepresent the view, uh, straw man, or uh, or say something that is guilty of the genetic fallacy, and and these these are fall they call them fallacies because they are fallacious. They don't work. They don't get people where they want to go. But because they sound clever, there's rhetoric involved with the way they do it, and they're all saying it together, and they're saying it really loudly. Um, then it sounds persuasive, yeah. not only to them, but to Christians. And they don't realize that a trick has been played on them. By the way, the others don't realize they're playing a trick for the most part. They, they're just reacting the way they're taught to react. Yeah. You know? So when, when uh, you know, I just watched a documentary two nights ago called Paint the Wall Black. It's really incredible. It's about 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. It's in on YouTube. Paint the wall black. It's about Nene's play in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this magnificent little restaurant that was in favor of everyone in this racially mixed neighborhood. Yeah. They were all run by Hispanics. They were Christians who went to a racially mixed church. They were wonderful people. But they would not kowtow to Black Lives Matter. They wouldn't give money to Black Lives Matter. And they wouldn't put BLM kind of posters on like other people were to protect their business. And so... BLM took them out with thousands of protesters. When I say took them out, they took them out literally. They destroyed the business. They made sure that everybody was fired from their other jobs, even the spouses who worked for mm-hmm. the organization. And um, and they uh, and they closed the thing down. And uh, the people who ran that successful business had to move to Dallas because their life was in jeopardy. Okay. Okay, so what you see there when you watch this documentary, it's really sad, but it's really incredible how the Christians comported themselves in the process, is you see all of this nasty, hosty, screaming, name-calling. There is no place at all for thoughtful engagement or discussion. It is just anger and hostility from the group, and injustice from the group that is fighting injustice and oppression and hate. It's, it's so crazy. It reminded me of, of the of the brown shirts, the SA, mm-hmm. in, in the early 30s in, in Nazi Germany. Not quite Nazi. It, it was not until 1933 that Hitler became yeah. chancellor because of the thugs, which are represented now with Antifa and Black Lives Matter. Uh, regardless of what people think about maybe their... Their, the, 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 some justification for their views. Like, this is totally separate. It's how they comport themselves, how they move their views forward. And uh, in it, 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 uh, it belies all their claims to concern about oppression and justice and, and getting rid of hate. Christians are the ones who get rid of hate. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Greg. So we're, we're going to move to our last question. And this one, just imagine I was your younger self. What advice... Would you tell me, if basically for the next generation, like what would you tell if you would go back and see your younger self? What would you tell yourself? That's a great question, and I'm pausing here because no one's ever asked me that question before. Though I have reflected a little mm-hmm. bit on it, <clears throat> I I <clears throat> I'm not sure what 
um, I would change in my case. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not that uh, I did everything right. Yeah. That's not my point. I, I do look back at a lot of things and say, that, 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 man, man I can't believe you said that. <laughs> you did that. You acted that way. You were an absolute idiot. Yeah. But the point is, the fact is, these are things that are learned over time under the discipline, mm. disciplinary, disciplinary hand of the Lord. If you stay in the saddle, if you stay yoked, you know, and you, you stay on board, this is where Hebrews 12 comes in. All discipline for the moment yeah. seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yes. But afterwards, for those who have been trained by it, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And just above that, the writer of Hebrews is saying, hey, you know, you're going to get disciplined because God's a good father. Yes. He knows what he's got to do. And so if you, if you stay in place, right, and uh, you are willing to endure the hardship that God always brings into your life, always brings into your life. Um, even if you don't understand it, you stay faithful, you stay in play, and say, okay, God, I hate this, but I want to do what's right. First Peter, let him who suffers according to the will of God entrust himself to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Okay, that's First Peter 4, first verse, I think. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an action guide for us. If you do that, then these things get worked out over time. But it's a long period of time to get worked out. Okay? A long period of time. That's just the way God works. It takes time. So, uh, but things that were in my life, I think that were really good, um, may not be in some others' lives, and I'll tell you what those were. And one of them is I was, I was closely involved in a Christian community with a disciple over me for a long time. Mm -hmm. Especially early on. Secondly, I got a very, very good biblical foundation. In, in other words, from Genesis to Revelation, I mean, there is a whole story here. There is a big picture. I understood the covenants, the Abrahamic covenant, yeah. the Mosaic covenant, the New Covenant, and the particular roles that they play. And this is also vital because all of this stuff is tied together. So in that regard, this is why I wrote the story of reality, because you get the big picture in a form, somewhat theologically simplified form. And then we have a course at Stand to Reason called the Bible Fast Forward. These are eight of 50 minute sessions. And as I like. What is it called again? The Bible Fast Forward. And uh, this lays a theological foundation for how the whole Bible is connected theologically. This is where you get a clear picture of how the, the role of the Mosaic Covenant yes. and the New Covenant. Uh, the Abrahamic Covenant, then the Mosaic Covenant, and the New Covenant come into play. Those are really, really important things. I get questioned just yesterday uh, on a broadcast about something about the law in Leviticus. And uh, what I have to tell people is Leviticus was written as a, as a, as a contract with Jews. It wasn't a contract with, them, with Gentiles. You, you can't read it as like Levitical things apply to me. Yeah. They don't. You know, uh, can we drink blood? That was illegal. Can we drink blood? Not that people wanted to drink blood, but they were wondering about yeah. how these laws apply. That was to the Jews. It wasn't for us. Now, there are some things in there that are universals, like nobody should be allowed to murder. Yes. But most of what people are so confused about that. They don't see the role of place. Anyway, so I'm just... What I'm saying is what helped me keep stable for 48 years as a follower of Christ is that I had, I had uh, a solid foundation from the beginning of people over my life, being part of a very particular Christian community that uh, we, in which I was discipled, and building a theological foundation where I understood, at least in the broadest concepts, the full counsel of God. And, and I'm just suggesting that uh, from our resources, the story of reality is the place to start because it gives you the broadest yes. characterization, and it's an, an easy read. And the, the worldview is based on five points. God, man, Jesus, cross, resurrection. That would be the final resurrection. So the beginning and the end and everything yeah. important that happened in between. And then if people wanted to actually take the course from Stanford the Reason, they get the DVDs and get the group together. There's a 150-page workbook that they get. They mm -hmm. print out. All the notes are there. It's a syllabus. So, And that awesome. will give them a much more thorough going. Uh, especially for you, Matt. I would say this is yeah. something you definitely yeah. need.
Yes. Okay, just as a theological foundation. Yes. Um, now, I'm offering that something that's available to everybody, but you're going to seminary, I know, and so that, it, that, that I, I got a degree in the Bible, and then I got a degree in apologetics, and then I got a degree in a master's in philosophy. So, mm -hmm. you know, I continue my education to fill in the gaps and be there. Yes. And so th those are the... It, it, these are the things that were in place in my life that I think were really good things that made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And as much as possible for any of your listeners, if they can get those same things in place yes. in their life, then they're, they're going to flourish spiritually. However, there's still going to be a lot of hard times, and they're going to get their butts kicked for the next 50, 60, 70, 80 years <laughs> because God's in the butt kicking business, to put it, uh, you know, coarsely maybe. Yeah. Um, but that's the kicks in the line. Yeah, amen. And that's the Hebrews 12 stuff that I was talking about. Yeah. Make sense? Of course, brother. Thank you so much. I mean... You're so welcome, really. Yeah. No, I'm glad to do this. It's just, This is what my days are for, mm -hmm. all right? And, and I know this isn't just for you and me. Yeah. If it were just for you, Max, it would be worth it. I'm just saying, Thank but you, it's not just for you and I, it's, it, or for you and me, it's, it's for all the people listening, yes. you know, and uh, my, my goal isn't to sell books and to sell products, my goal is to build disciples, and so when I recommend something, whether it's my book or somebody yeah. else's, it's because I think that that's going to help, um, uh, help accomplish that goal. And I would suggest that um, your listeners go to str.org and, yes. and uh, subscribe in the upper right-hand corner of, of our homepage. Subscribe so that the free training material that we produce at Standard Reason, they'll, they'll be able to get. And we just send it digitally or send mail, however you want it. And uh, um, stay with you. You become a member of our community. That's the way I look at it. And, uh, and, and, and one, of the, one of the individuals that our team wants to mentor and disciple over time. Awesome, awesome. I mean, yeah, I guess that's it. I mean, I'm still new to like interviews and everything, so like, I don't know how to end it, but like, I just want to <laughs> thank you so much. Like, I'm just so like, I'm just so overwhelmed. It's such a blessing. Like, I would never be in this if it wasn't for Christ. Like, there's no way I would be interviewing, you know, like Gregory Google, like to hear your wisdom throughout your life. And it's just like, like, this still like mind boggles me sometimes. It's just like, if it wasn't for Christ, like, I wouldn't be doing, like, all of this is just grace. Like, I, like, none of this, I deserve it. I don't deserve none oh, of this. Well, <laughs> well you're so welcome. And I, I'm glad I had so many people um, uh, invest themselves in my own life. So it's, it's a treat for me to do the same for others like you. Thank you. All right, Max. All the best to you. And you too, brother. I do want to follow up on the possibility of uh, having you on the air for 20 minutes or so and talking about your own testimony. Okay. That would be great. Okay, I'll make a note of that and we'll have somebody in touch with you, you know, sooner or later, kind of. Okay. We'll so, see you next. Sounds good, brother. Thank you so much again. God keep you. You too, brother.